I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a video for my professional responsibility class. Here I'm going to be talking about the Supreme Court case, Upjohn Company versus United States from 1981. This is about attorney-client privilege, specifically when an attorney is representing a uh, corporation. There's a lot of different people, usually in big companies, that the attorney for the corporation may interact with. And some of those conversations are going to be privileged, and others are not. And this was the landmark decision where the Supreme Court really set forth the elements or factors to decide whether a, a communication in that context will be covered by attorney-client privilege. This is a big case. It's not only in a lot of professional responsibility case books, it's often in evidence case books uh, when, evidence, uh, when an evidence course spends a day or so on attorney-client privilege. So this is actually a good case to know, not only in practice, and for the MPRE, but also for the bar exam. I have separate videos about uh, the basics of attorney-client privilege doctrine and about work product doctrine, which you should watch together with these. But here I just want to focus on this very important case in this context. So let's dive in. Um, Upjohn was a large international pharmaceutical company um, uh, back in that period in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. It has since merged with another uh, big pharma company. But its board back then at the time learned that a manager at one of its foreign plants was accused of bribing foreign officials in exchange for business there. And they were basically anticipating a government investigation from um, either the Securities and Exchange Commission or the IRS or both. Uh, there's a body of federal law that prohibits American corporation uh, workers from bribing officials in foreign countries to get um, concessions or contracts or um, to make it easier to export items they produce and so forth. And this often affects what gets reported on corporate tax returns. Usually the company doesn't list uh, bribes to foreign officials as one of their expenditures. And so not only does the Securities and Exchange Commission get involved, but often the IRS does. If you're reading the case for class, uh, the, by the time it gets to the Supreme Court, the IRS is really the relevant other party or government party besides um, the Upjohn Corporation. Okay, so let's meet some of our characters. This is Gerard Thomas, who was general counsel for many years for Upjohn Corporation. He also had a distinguished legal career before that. When Upjohn's board learned about the problem, they asked their general counsel to do an internal audit or investigation to assess how widespread the problem was. They wanted to know, was this an isolated incident or were they in, potentially gonna be in a lot of trouble? Was this a widespread practice or part of the corporate culture? Actually, it was not just an isolated incident, unfortunately. So what um, this lawyer did is he sent confidential uh, surveys to all the foreign and area managers asking questions about possible bribery by themselves or other managers um, that worked with them. And he uh, also conducted a lot of as many of these surveys in person uh, that he, as he could. And he uh, took notes res regarding um, the respondents answers. So this, uh, when it comes to this survey, this survey included a clear statement that this was at the board's request. It wasn't just the lawyer doing it on his own. And it was confidential and uh, related to the corporation's legal interest. I think the lawyer communicated pretty clearly to them that there was um, a, a pending government investigation. Once they um, had all the surveys done and uh, had sort of scoped out the uh, uh, extent of the problem internally, Upjohn's lawyers preemptively volunteered notice to the Securities and Exchange Commission and the IRS of the, that they had done this internal audit. They admitted that they had found some wrongdoing at which they were um, correcting. Now, why did they do this? Why did they even tell the government that they had uh, looked into it themselves? Well, they wanted to show that they were making good faith efforts to stop these practices, that the board was not encouraging it in any way. They didn't want to have liability for the top managers or the board. 
And so they thought that it would go better with them, with the government investigators and relevant regulators, if they could show that they um, were also trying to be vigilant and root out the problem. So they um, told them that they had looked into the matter, they had found some wrongdoing, they were firing the people responsible and, and so forth. So um, it's not that surprising that the IRS, when they heard this, wanted to see these survey responses themselves and notes themselves. And so they issued a summons for them, which um, means that the Upjohn would be legally obligated uh, to turn this over. This is um, like doing something in pre-trial discovery, except um, the um, IRS has authority to do this at the investigatory stage before there even a complaint or enforcement action has been filed in court. And Upjohn, through its lawyers, objected that the documents were protected by attorney-client privilege and work product doctrine. Uh, they argued this in the alternative, and I want to explain why. Uh, attorney-client privilege and work product are related in that they both have to do with keeping certain um, communications or documents confidential. Some, sometimes communications or conversations would be protected by both at the same time. They're privileged and covered by work product. But each of those doctrines has its own elements and its own ex exemptions or exceptions. And uh, to be honest, at the time going into this case, it was not completely clear if either would apply. And I'll try to explain that as we uh, proceed. Um, so the lawyer argued both. Ultimately, though, the Supreme Court held that attorney-client privilege did apply, so they didn't have to decide whether this was protected work product. So Upjohn wins, and here are the Upjohn factors. If you um, are taking notes on this uh, uh, video, you may want to pause and write these down. This is what you really need to know for exams and for the bar exam. And when you're in practice, these are our general factors. Now, as you can, will see, um, each of these could be uh, litigated a little bit around the edges. But first, it's a lawyer for a corporation who communicates with relevant corporate employees. So we don't even have a case like this if it's the lawyer's um, conversation, let's say, with the president of the corporation. The problem is a lot of the conversations with lower level employees in the corporation will not be privileged. And even though the lawyer is representing the corporation and they are working for the corporation, it has to be at the board's direction or behest or um, the next best thing, like the CEO or president or um, a vice president who supervises the legal work over general counsel and so on. And it has to be expressly confidential, not just accidentally confidential, but they were clearly trying to um, keep the conversation uh, protected by privilege. And it has to be about a topic that relates to the employee's actual work for the company and that's related to a matter that affects the legal interests of the corporation. So keep in mind, you have to have all of those factors present in order for attorney-client privilege to apply. So, uh, for example, if a lawyer just has a kind of a, a pleasant chit-chat about sports or the weather um, or... Um, the uh, the construction on the building that's going on or the uh, uh, things like that with a, a lower level employee somebody in the uh, um, dining hall at the at the company um, that's probably not going to be privileged um, it has to be with someone who's it's relevant it's about their work it relates to legal interests it was the initiative for the conversation came a uh, direction for, is top down not coming from the bottom up not initiated by the employee um, himself or herself and it needs to be held in confidence. I, I will tell you there's a number of cases where um, it, either the lawyer or an employee decided to CC a whole bunch of other people or maybe the, everybody who worked for the company on an email that's almost always going to negate attorney-client privilege. So these need to be confidential uh, communications, not a, um, a, um, an e a blast email to the, every, all the employees or all the staff or something like that. It has to be expressly confidential. Now, what about other situations like a, a whistleblower? So whistleblowers and disgruntled lower level employees who approach in-house counsel on their own about a legal issue they've observed in the workplace might not be privileged because this wasn't done at the behest of the corporate directors. Now, if the lawyer 
responds, uh, takes what the whistleblower says and goes to the corporate director and, and says, I think we have a problem, we should do an investigation. And then they ask the lawyer to follow up. From that point on, if the lawyer goes back to that person with some follow-up questions, those conversations will probably be privileged. But because it was the employee taking the initiative and approaching the lawyer, um, it's not clear that attorney-client privilege would apply even if after the board hears about it, they're glad someone came forward and so forth. And the same is true about um, complaints. So a lot of companies have either um, a, an, a way to file a complaint or a grievance against a supervisor um, a, 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 a online with a form or they have a complaint box that employees uh, can use and you, some of them will allow this anonymously. Um, these are usually not going to be privileged because they're not uh, submitted under the purview of directives from the management. It's not the management is telling everyone, hey, we think we have a legal issue with um, the way employees are being treated or work conditions. Please tell us what you think. If it's the employee taking the initiative, usually privilege will not apply. Again, remember, that if the response of management is to ask the lawyer to follow up with the person and ask a few more questions, those conversations may be privileged if they're held confidentially and it's clear that it relates to the employee's um, duties at the workplace and or tasks that, they're, uh, that are part of their job and that it's held in confidence. So that's the Upjohn case and that concludes our presentation about this case.